When I was young and obsessed with Garfield, one of my biggest interests relating to the series was hunting down, finding, and dissecting lost or rare Garfield comics. And I was damn good at it. For instance, did you know that the creators of Blondie had a very good relationship with Jim Davis and that on numerous occasions the two comics crossed over? The first was during the April Fool's switcheroo, where the two teams took over each other's comics. And the second was during Blondie's 75th anniversary, where Dagwood showed up in Garfield to invite John to his anniversary party, and then Garfield and other classic comic characters started showing up in the Blondie strip. This artist forgot that Garfield thanks all of his lines, which is something that very much annoyed me as a child. My point is that finding lost Garfield comics has always been a big interest of mine, and this month, I found the Treasure Trove, a collection of strips which totally rewrites the history of Garfield from the bottom up. And because of that, this is probably the greatest thing I've ever accomplished in my entire life. Which, now that I say that out loud, that's... It's pretty sad, isn't it? And today's piece of investigative journalism is brought to you thanks to the premier Garfield streaming service and today's sponsor. Verve. Go to verve.co slash quentin or check out that link in the description to get a totally ad-free 30-day trial of Verve Premium. Once again, that's vrv.co slash q-u-i-n-t-o-n. So if you've been following the channel at all recently, you hopefully know that last week I released Arbuckle, a fan film based around my interpretation of the Garfield comic. I put a lot of easter eggs in there that I really want you guys to find on your own, but my favorite detail was how we got Liz's G1 makeup on point. But the biggest detail, of course, was my use of Jim Davis's other work in sort of a meta fashion, specifically Norm Nat, my favorite piece of obscure Garfield lore. Norm Nat is a name that is pretty recognizable to most every Garfield fan because it's something that Jim Davis used to talk about a lot. Especially at the start of his career, whenever he was interviewed about Garfield, Jim Davis would always go on a tangent about this lost piece of work which just didn't make it. Norm has become synonymous with the old mantra of failure coming before success, of a flop preceding a great legacy. But for the longest time, despite this, no one really knew much about the comic. We knew that it was published in a weekly published Indiana newspaper known as the Pendleton Times, that it featured a group of comedic bugs going on various misadventures and having funny conversations, and that it supposedly infamously ended with Norm being killed as a giant foot fell from the sky and crushed him to death. But aside from that, we didn't even really have a range of dates for when it started and stopped publication. The Lost Media Wiki claims that it ran from 1972 to 1977, but there are no sources for this. At worst, it could be a guess, and at the very best, they could have gotten it from a newspaper article that was also guessing. And out of the four total comics available online at this point, they were all extremely low quality, and one of them wasn't even in English for some reason. And since I was setting out to feature this character substantially in my short film, I thought that it was about time that I did a little bit of sleuthing. And what I ended up discovering was very shocking, I assure you. Okay, so immediately, obviously, I was able to figure out that this was the newspaper that it was printed in, but I couldn't find any of the newspapers online. But then the Lost Media Wiki pointed me to an obscure blog post which indicated that a local library called the Pendleton Community Library had actually archived all of the newspapers and they just weren't available online. But then I started thinking, my hometown has like a historian, surely Pendleton would have one too. And so I did some sleuthing, I found out that they did, I got in contact with her, I explained my plight, and she was able to go to this library and get me digital scans of many of the newspapers which featured the comics in question. Obviously, Obviously, she couldn't get me all of the comics because it's a weekly publication and there were probably almost a hundred strips in total, but she was able to get me enough that I got a good feel for the comic. And so now in this video, we're going to stop and we're going to analyze the long lost Norm Nat comic. But I want to clarify something real quick. When I chose to call this video Lost Garfield Comics, that was not clickbait. Norm Nat is not the actual lost media goldmine which I have created this video to talk about. It's just a really interesting topic that is just naturally along the path that we should stop and discuss. So if you stick around just a little bit more in the video, I swear to you there's something so incredible it's gonna blow your minds. Jim Davis, from what I can tell, started Norm Nat in either 1972 or 1973. I'm just going to go with 1973 for now because it was in April 1973 that the first easily accessible reference to Norm was made in the local newspaper The Muncie Star. 
Cartoonist Tom Ryan's able assistant, Jim Davis, reveals he has been submitting his own strip to the Pendleton Independent newspaper. Norm Nat is a funny piece about bugs, and Davis intends to begin the approach to syndicates, which is the only route to success in a cartoon strip. And thus, Jim Davis started work on a comic which he hoped would bring him fame and stability. Hi Norman! Make any New Year's resolutions? Yes I have, Lyman. I have resolved to never again set you up for any more of your rotten puns. I made a resolution too. <laughs> I resolved to paint my car green and snoo. What's snoo? I think I just gone and done it again. Norm Nat's premise is pretty simple. Norm is a bug living in a community of other bugs who will get into adventures and other comedic situations with his friends. I would argue that the comedy of Garfield actually owes a lot to this strip's style. After all, the structure of a Norm comic is pretty similar to that of Davis's other work. The first panel features dialogue, the second a little more setup, and the third has the main character glaring through the fourth wall and making some witty comment. Norm sees his friends, he has outgoing adventures, he has strong opinions and thoughts, and yet he still has that cynical, lazy edge. He's essentially both John and Garfield rolled into one character. Although perhaps what he is most infamous for is his terrifying design, which even I cannot bring myself to defend. There's nothing comforting about him, he's just gross. He actually reminds me of the feeling I get when I see a cockroach in the real world. Although I feel like I have to point out how similar Norm's design is to that of Sonic the Hedgehog. Like, come on. Like most newspaper comics of the time, Norm Nat would further push the antics of its leads by pushing them through continuous storylines. For instance, one string of comics surrounded Norm unsuccessfully trying to run for mayor, and another featured him contemplating suicide. My girlfriend Natasha won't so much as give me the time of day. To demonstrate my love for her, I shall jump from lover's leap. Eh, someday. Don't jump off lover's leap, Norm! I must demonstrate my love for Natasha. She isn't worth it. She's worth 20 jumps, maybe even 22 or 23. But you'll be killed. Good point. Norm Nat actually started to grow on me the more that I read his comics. I think it's partially that I find the early Garfield comics with John and Lyman to be pretty charming, and Norm features a lot of that same kind of comedy. It's a lot more adventurous and daring than Davis's other work, but sadly the characters just don't stick out as much, and I think that's its main failing. Somewhere halfway through 1975, Davis stopped drawing Norm like this, and started drawing him like this. And I, for the life of me, have no idea why. Maybe he was trying to tweak the design to make him more appealing, but I think it could also be that Davis obviously had totally lost his passion for the strip by this point. After two years of working on the series, it had become very clear that no one really liked it enough to petition for him to keep it around, and so, he decided to end it. As I've mentioned before, Davis has long stated that he ended the comic by having Norm be killed unceremoniously Monty Python style by a rogue foot. But much to my surprise, in my research I discovered that this seems to be nothing more than an urban legend invented by him years later. The final two strips in Norm feature no deaths and no giant feet. The final comic with an actual narrative features a gag about poker, and the next comic was a large banner wishing the readers a Merry Christmas and thanking Pendleton by name. The final Norm comic wasn't a cynical or depressing mockery of the series, nor a morbid scene of all the characters being killed in various ways, but a wholesome dedication to all the people who stuck by it despite its numerous infamous flaws. And in the end, I think that's a whole lot better than the urban legend that's been spread around. But here's the thing. Norm Nat wrapped up on Christmas Day 1975, and Garfield didn't start publication until June 1978. Call me Marty McFly, because I've screwed up this timeline pretty badly. What was Jim Davis doing in the almost three-year gap between the end of Norm Nat and the start of Garfield? What, was he homeless? Was he working at a fast food restaurant? What the hell? And just as I was wondering what this could possibly mean, making a billion guesses, all of which were probably wrong, my contact in Pendleton sent over another batch of comics, with the description line, Here is John. And before I even opened that email, I was drawn to that title. John is, of course, the name of Garfield's owner, and it also happens to be the name of a really good fan comic, which is, in my opinion, the best piece of Garfield media made in years. 
And based on all that information, you're probably wondering, does this lost media comic entitled John have anything to do with Garfield? And well, let's just find out. Hi there, I'm John Arbuckle. I'm a cartoonist, and this is my cat, Garfield. Hi there, I'm Garfield. I'm a cat, and this is my cartoonist, John. I'm at a loss for a word to describe this trip. Try turkey. Our only thought is to entertain you. Feed me! John is Garfield. It's the comic that Jim Davis did for the Pendleton Times after he got bored with Norm, which he continued to do through the start of 1978 until he was picked up nationally and he readapted each comic one by one. Garfield existed two and a half years before almost every source ever has claimed, and no one has known about this for 40 years. Okay, this is why this is particularly exhilarating and exciting to someone like me. The Garfield fandom, as silly as it is to say, is based heavily in tradition. Whenever a character is introduced, usually with time, that date becomes the character's official birthday. And whenever that date comes back around in the calendar, characters will celebrate the anniversary of that particular comic. Every year on June the 19th, Garfield's birthday happens. He gets a cake that's really big, or probably has too many candles. He makes a joke about it that he's probably made before, and millions of people stop and go to the website to look this up. It stopped being funny about 30 years ago, but it's less about it actually being good and more about it being comforting to go back and see that every year. But now, Garfield's birthday is like Jesus' birthday, in that it's about six months off. All your life, you've been told that Garfield was born on June the 19th, 1978, and all your life, you've been lied to. Garfield was born on January the 8th, 1976, in Pendleton, Indiana. The Church of Garfield will call me blasphemous. I'll be mocked and shunned, but I speak the truth, and you know it! Uh, so yeah, that was... It's an interesting factoid to me. So let's stop and read some of these comics as we go through some of the best ones and I give you my expert Garfield historian analysis, telling you everything you need to know about how the strip evolved from 1976 to 1978. The first thing we need to talk about isn't anything about these strips specifically, but instead just about the title, John by Jim Davis. It's a little surreal to find out, four decades later, that when the first Garfield strip was released, the comic was actually named after the cat's owner. It's also sort of gratifying for me, because of my long history of describing John as the main character of the comic. It's just really cool to find out that the comic was literally named after him when it started. When you think about it, it makes a lot of sense from Jim Davis's point of view to name it like this. After all, the comic was pretty clearly inspired by Peanuts by Charles Schultz. And while Snoopy was the most marketable part of that series, it still chose to focus on its two leads, Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. A Charlie Brown Christmas. Snoopy was always the one that sold the plushes, and Charlie Brown was always the one that got top billing. So why not the same for Garfield and John Arbuckle? Speaking of changes in name, one of the biggest changes between the two takes on the series is the name of Lyman's dog. Here's John by Jim Davis, dated February the 3rd, 1977. Spot, look what you did on the floor! No, 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 no! So that's why they call him Spot. And here's Garfield, dated August the 15th, 1978. Odie, look what you did on the floor! No, 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 no! They should have named him Spot. Isn't that just surreal? It's like watching two parallel universes play out at the same time. Yes, Odie's original name was Spot, something that Jim Davis changed because he realized that it was sort of a cliche in the world of comics. And it's crazy to look at this comic specifically, which was originally based entirely around making a pun out of Spot's name, only to see the punchline be bent awkwardly to try and make the pun still work in the new version. Here's another comic about Spot that was never fully adapted, which I'm including mainly because I think it's really, really funny. Some name for a dog, Spot. I think I'll see if I can knock that Spot off. Garfield! No jury in the world would have convicted me. Moving on, this comic is from January the 27th, 1977. This would have been a little over a year after Jim started doing this comic, and by my math, it probably would have been comic number 55. 
This comic shows John sitting at Irene's diner. You'll probably notice two things. The first is that this is a very challenging angle for Jim Davis's work. Most Garfield comics are drawn around a flat, colored surface or table, making a shot that's simple and easy to repeat. But here, John is sitting at the bar at an angle, with another stool just barely visible. I frankly think it's a very pleasing shot. The other thing you'll notice is that John is alone. After all, if the comic was named after John, why would Garfield be needed in any particular strip? It wouldn't be until he remade the comic as Garfield that he would start choosing to include the cat in every single strip, despite how often it didn't really make sense. I'll finally let the comic talk for itself now. Morning, hun. Morning, Irma. The coffee's strong, hun. You'd better get it before it gets you. Is it hot? Yep. This is one of my favorite Garfield gags. It's so subtle that it takes your mind a second to process, but it hits you like a ton of bricks when it does. By the way, if you've never lived in or around Indiana, Irma is a satire of Waffle House employees. It's interesting to note that despite this version in John being the 55th comic in that series, the Garfield comic didn't adapt this one until comic 479. The dialogue was slightly altered, the angle simplified, but the more pressing change was that Garfield was added to the table and delivered a final one-liner to make the punchline really land. This isn't one of your better diners. But boy oh boy, if you want changes bigger than that, I can give you changes much bigger than that. Here's Garfield, dated June the 26th, 1979. The doctor will see your cat in a moment. Who's next, please? I think I just died and went to heaven. I think I just died. And here's John, April the 29th, 1976. Dr. Gustav Stitch will see you now. Dr. Stitch is the name and fixin' sickies is the game. Where does it hurt? I'll kiss it and make it well. Ho ho! I foresee the AMA boycotting this strip. This right here is perhaps the most mystifying thing about John. Out of all the comics that Davis readapted later or changed pieces of to make it work in Garfield, there are a good number of comics that he just threw away, potentially because some of them were just a little too weird. This TV season really stinks, Garfield. With, of course, the one exception. Farrah Fawcett. Farrah Fawcett. There were so many comics I found while researching this. I actually ended up requesting more scans because I found John to be a lot more interesting than Norm, despite it not being the thing that I was originally researching. And I could sit here all day analyzing the various differences between each and every adaptation, but I think we'll wrap this up on one that a lot of you will be very interested in. You know the pipe strip? The one that everyone says is perhaps the greatest Garfield comic of all time? It has a predecessor, and in the original, the pipe was a candy cane. Yes, I am aware that this is the most important historical discovery of our generation. You are very welcome. Putting these minor issues aside, obviously the biggest difference between John by Jim Davis and Garfield by Jim Davis is, well, Garfield and more generally, how different the art style is between the two runs. John and Lyme and his characters start off with totally different styles that are just fascinating to look at. And it should go without saying that Odie's original look is just entirely shocking to me. You remind me today of a small Mexican chihuahua. But as I said, Garfield the character is the biggest surprise. Even as a fan who is used to his early evolution, I was shocked that this, this, was his original look. No stripes, no details, big cheeks, barely a mouth at first, freckles around his face, a weird mark on his tail. It's just weird. But I think the more I looked at the comic, the more it started to grow on me. Not as something I actually like or I would want to keep around, but just as a historical thing to study. This was the earliest drawing Jim Davis ever did of Garfield. And he didn't get a single thing right. But it started this massive legacy, one that still lasts today. And for that, this very image deserves to be placed in the Smithsonian and toured all around the world like a lost Van Gogh. Everything we have today, everything we hold dear and care about, it all started on January the 8th, 1976. John by Jim Davis ran unchanged until August the 1st, 1977. This was when Jim Davis decided to give the comic a brand new title. This was, of course, Spot. I'm, I'm joking, it was, it, he calls it Garfield at this point. Garfield then continued to be printed in the Times through January 1978 before it disappeared suddenly. In March, an article was printed with two new comics showing a brand new design for Garfield. 
alongside the announcement that the cat would be leaving Pendleton for mainstream syndication. Cartoonist Jim Davis, a friend of mine since way before either of us was old enough to shave, finally had his attempts to get the cartoon strip syndicated come to a happy conclusion late in January when United Feature Syndicate called to announce their acceptance of Garfield and his friends. We owe our thanks to him for helping us brighten our pages with his artwork, and we wish him all the success in the world with Garfield and friends. It's always nice to watch someone's dream come true. And that's the story of how Garfield came to be, all thanks to a small newspaper in a town called Pendleton, Indiana. People, I joke, and I kid, and I make the memes as they say. But when I opened that email and I saw that attachment, and I realized that I was looking at the very first Garfield comic, which no one had seen in almost 45 years, all I could think was, I am the luckiest Garfield fan on the entire planet. And of course, my second thought was, why has this taken so long to come out? The main reason I did this as a video instead of just putting out a couple tweets is under the hopes that by making this, I can reach someone at Paws Incorporated. If you have any position of power at Garfield HQ and you are seeing this video by chance, I have only one thing to say to you. Release these comics. Oh, come on, people buy all kinds of Garfield books. They'll buy Garfield comic books that Garfield isn't even in. You think people won't be interested in buying a collection of long lost rare Jim Davis comics? You could call it John and Norm before Garfield was Garfield, or maybe just Garfield, the Pendleton years. Make a big press release, blow people's minds. You know people would eat that kind of thing up. The ball is in your court, Paws Incorporated. The ball is in your court. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and leave a PDF in the description with all the comics I was able to get a hold of. I think it was about 40 or 50 in the end. And as you add this to all the Garfield wikis and websites across the internet, expanding and rewriting the history of the comic from scratch, you can go ahead and say that this was all made possible thanks to the amazing detective slash genius, Quentin Reviews. And while you're on that Garfield hide that this will no doubt leave you on, why don't you go ahead and check out today's sponsor, Verve Premium. Verve is a streaming website that features a long string of your favorite shows, from Rooster Teeth classics like Red vs. Blue to the famous Harmon Quest. But its best feature is the classic series Garfield and Friends, now streaming at a quality unrivaled by other sources. And by signing up to Verve Premium, you'll get all of these channels totally ad-free with the ability to download many of them for offline viewing, and with exclusive shows available only to you through this service. And you can unlock all of this if you go to verve.co slash Quinton. Once again, that's vrv.co slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. With that, I've been Quinton Reviews, and that's all you need. Oh, it's so hot!